Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for tonight's New York ACP talk. My name is Kim Kranz. I'm the Suffolk District President for the New York ACP, um, and I'm happy to have two of my colleagues from Stony Brook present for us tonight. Um, so I'd like to introduce both speakers before we go into the talk. So Dr. Suzanne Fields is Professor of Medicine, Chief of the v Division of Geriatrics, General Internal Medicine and Hospital Medicine, as well as the Co-Director for the Center for Healthy Aging at Stony Brook Medicine. And Dr. Nikhil Kalakar is Associate Professor in Clinical Psychiatry, Behavioral Health, uh, Neuro and Medicine. He serves as the Vice Chair of Ambulatory Affairs for Psychiatry and is Director of the Jerry Psych Program, the Jerry Psych Fellowship Program, the Center of Excellence for Alzheimer's Disease, and the Clinical Training Programs. So we're happy to have both presenters here tonight to talk about new advances uh, and the work of outpatient for Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Fields. Thank you. May I have the first slide, please? These are just some of the faces of Alzheimer's disease. In the bottom left, you can see Tony Bennett, who just passed away at the age of 96, who was diagnosed, I believe, in 2016 with Alzheimer's disease and continued to give concerts till about 2021. And in the center um, is Rosalind Carter, uh, the latest um, wife, well, the wife of President Carter, who was just diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So tonight's learning objectives will, um, hopefully the attendees at the end of our two talks, will be able to recognize modifiable factors. And this is really, to me as an internist, one of the most exciting aspects of um, the latest findings on dementia, that many of the risk factors are preventable and modifiable. Um, also thought I would go over the billing requirements for 99483, which is care planning for dementia. Um, hopefully people will understand how to recognize, detect, diagnose, treat, and care plan uh, for patients with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias using standardized instruments that are recommended uh, by the Alzheimer's Association and then delineate non-pharmacologic and pharmacologic approaches to managing the common challenging behaviors in patients with Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Palakar will uh, discuss biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease, um, new diagnostic tools, others that are on the horizon, and he'll also discuss the risks and benefits of some of the newer treatments and mention ongoing trials uh, at Stony Brook and elsewhere, what research questions remain to be answered, and there are many. Um, it's important to note that dementia is a global term like pneumonia, um, but it's the acquired loss of cognition in multiple cognitive domains, not just memory. And importantly, it results in a loss of function. Next slide. And Alzheimer's accounts for somewhere around 70% of cases, but internists um, also see that a lot of vascular dementia um, and there are different types of vascular dementia. If you go to the next slide, please. Including post-stroke, but we also see a lot of patients who have subcortical dementia where the urinary incontinence and gait abnormalities occur earlier typically. And um, it could be lacunar, due to lacunar infarcts, or you'll also see um, reports on the MRI of white matter hyperintensities or small vessel ischemic disease. Next slide, please. Over 6 million Americans have Alzheimer's disease and the prevalence increases as people age. So 32% of people over 85 have Alzheimer's disease. But if you look at like the Boston study, East Boston study, it was almost 50% of people over 85 or in their 90s who had dementia, much higher percentage because they, the mixed dementias are more common as people get older. And dementia patients, um, had a disproportionate number of COVID-19 deaths, and they account for an increased number of hospitalizations. 
Next slide, please. This slide just goes over the new NIA Alzheimer's Association revised diagnostic criteria, which are really more helpful for research purposes than necessarily clinical purposes. Um, but they talk about a preclinical phase, mild cognitive impairment, where you may have loss of memory and one or more other cognitive domain, but there's no impact on function. That's how it's different from dementia. And then there are three stages of dementia, early, middle, and late. And the late stages really should be viewed as a terminal condition. Next slide. And this slide just shows the natural history that there's a long preclinical phase. And I'm going to uh, talk a bit about this tonight uh, because in the past three years or so, we're learning more and more about the risk factors and what's going on in the brain of patients before they develop uh, symptoms. And then there's a phase of um, mild cognitive impairment not everybody with mild cognitive impairment goes on to Alzheimer's disease, however, and that's important to note. And then there's an accelerated rate of decline with the onset of cognitive impairment. So that by, you know, 10 years after the onset of diagnosis, most people have either died or are in a nursing home or totally impaired functionally. New slide. I find um, Riesberg's FAST scale very useful because there are seven stages of dementia and um, it divides them into mild, moderate, and severe, but he attaches um, neurologic deficits with each stage. And for example, in stage six, people will have difficulty with ADL functions and then in stage seven, they're almost, it's almost like the reverse of normal development in a child, where in the very late stages, they can't even hold up their head. They lose the ability to walk, to speak. But notice that's very late in Alzheimer's disease. The incontinence and the immobility and the aphasia are late findings, not early findings of Alzheimer's. Next slide. Now, the Lancet Commission in 2020 came out with a report, and um, I urge all of you to take a look at it. They, they discussed um, biomarkers, new therapeutics, a lot about cognitive training in COVID. But what I found most interesting was that they noted 12 modifiable risk factors for about 40% of worldwide dementias and three new, including alcohol consumption, head injury, and air pollution. Next slide. And if you look at the 12 modifiable risk factors for dementia, what you can see is that low educational levels, social isolation, depression, diabetes, head injury, um, hearing impairment, and, and hypertension all account for some of the dementias that we find. They're modifiable risk factors. And APOE, which is genetic component, is 7%, but hearing impairment, for example, is 8%. Next slide. And just last month in the AJPM, uh, there was an article looking at sleep disturbances in older adults that found that patients who have trouble falling asleep or who use sleep medications, or who have obstructive sleep apnea or non-REM sleep disorder have a very high risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. So you could argue that that's another risk that we should be thinking about in our patients. Next slide. Um, there was another recent study that um, found metabolic syndrome in other words, obesity, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, hypertension, linked to periventricular white matter hyperintensities. And those can cause, will be linked to brain aging and dementia. Next slide. And Valentin Fuster has been leading um, a worldwide effort 
Um, and they looked at um, subclinical atherosclerosis and brain metabolism in middle-aged individuals in a study that was published in 2021 called the PISA study. And he found low global uh, FDG uptake on PET scans in middle-aged individuals with high Framingham risk scores, especially those with hypertension and carotid plaque burden. And interestingly, the brain areas that were affected with low metabolism were the parietotemporal regions and the cingulate gyrus, which are the same areas known to be affected by Alzheimer's disease. So the question arises whether hypoperfusion from arteriosclerosis causes hypoxemia in the brain leading to cell death in the brain. So it's another hypothesis for arteriosclerosis being involved in causing dementia. New, new slide. And this just illustrates the, um, the PET scans in these patients who were a higher risk in midlife. So that might be on that first slide I showed you of the curve that may be in the preclinical phase. New slide. And microvascular disease in the brain has been tied to high LDL levels. Next slide, please. So as we give preventive advice to middle-aged individuals in our practice, you know, we could say, well, you have to get your LDL down probably to close to 70, according to Fuster. Um, but controlling blood pressure and Fuster feels it should be less than 120. Um, the Canadian task force recommends systolic less than 120 in younger individuals. The Lancet paper recommended less than 130. Um, but that's important in midlife controlling hypertension. Certainly using a hearing aid, if hearing impaired, preventing head injury, limiting alcohol intake, stopping smoking, reducing obesity, um, and sustaining physical activity in mid and later life, very important. And um, some people have looked at Mediterranean or Scandinavian diets as being protective and in cognitively intact individuals. Dietary supplements do not help. Um, but treating depression with antidepressants or other therapies may be useful as well, since as we noted in the previous slides, depression is a risk factor as well. Next slide. So then it takes us to what are the latest evidence-based dementia guidelines? The psychiatric guidelines are really um, quite old, I think. Um, Dr. Palakar can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they date back to like 2014. So I tried to find some newer ones. The Australia guidelines um, talk about how you care and communicate with people who have dementia. And the key take home points that I gleaned from this is that patients with mild cognitive impairment need to be followed every six to 18 months, depending on the degree of impairment. Uh, to see if they go on to have dementia. And they also advise screening for elder abuse. Um, in 2018, the Alzheimer's Association published a series of articles in a gerontologist uh, supplement, again, with management tips on Alzheimer's disease, calling for an interdisciplinary team approach to care. A lot of community supports were recommended um, in 2019, the Fifth Canadian Consensus Conference convened, and they published their recommendations in Alzheimer's and Dementia 2020. And um, again, they had a lot of points on distinguishing vascular dementia from Alzheimer's disease also recommended either Keppra or Lamotrigine for patients with Alzheimer's who have seizures. Those were some of the key points uh, there. And they recommended treating AFib and hypertension in patients with cognitive impairment and without, again, to try to ameliorate or prevent you know, strokes or multi-infarct dementia. 
And then there was the 2020 European guideline uh, on the Academy of Neurology as well. Next slide. Other recommendations from the Fifth Canadian Conference were uh, that the MRI is the diagnostic tool of choice for imaging uh, in patients with Alzheimer's disease looking for medial temporal atrophy. And there are ways of doing semi-quantitative like structural analysis that can you know, look for medial temporal atrophy or involvement of the hippocampus. Um, again, they address treating hypertension uh, in those who are cognitively intact as well as the middle-aged. Um, they said they don't recommend aspirin for people with mite white matter lesions or small vessel ischemic disease, but they thought it was reasonable for patients who actually do have infarcts. And they call for early identification rather than screening, except for high-risk patients like those with delirium, dementia, diabetes, or Parkinson's. And they also warned internists to look for non-cognitive markers for dementia, like slow gait speed, frailty, late onset neuropsychiatric symptoms, and sleep disturbances. Next slide. Can you just, go? I'm sorry. And the things that they um, suggest that we look at are, you know, forgetfulness, uh, patients having problems with IADL functions, not remembering appointments to the doctors. We often will say they're non-compliant, but maybe they're just forgetful. Getting lost um, on the road, uh, inviting strangers into their home, having impaired driving skills, a lot of fender benders. These are like warning signs that there may be something going on. Next slide. So some practical tips, you might wanna look for, um, you know, ask patients about memory loss, motor vehicle accidents, falls during your annual Medicare wellness visit. And if the patients are concerned about their memory, then having them come doing a screen on those patients or even screening all patients with a simple tool and then having those who are impaired come back for more formal assessment. It's also important to establish goals of care, what matters most to the patient and um, asking about things like, would you want a feeding tube you know, at the end of life uh, just to get their sense of what matters most to them? Is it comfort? Is it palliation at the end of life? Um, because New York State requires doctors to put in feeding tubes for patients who can't eat, um, who are mentally impaired, uh, but not if the patient has expressed verbally or in writing that they don't want it. So I think that's probably one of the most important things to ask patients early on when they still can voice their opinions. Of course, identifying a healthcare proxy, durable power of attorney, filling out a most form, and referring them to an elder care attorney so that they can afford their care later on. And there are tools, some of pharmacies will um, pre-fill uh, pill boxes or put the meds in pill packs to make it easier for the patients to adhere to medicines if they forget their meds. Next slide. This is an example of the MINICOG, which we use in our practice as part of the annual wellness visit to screen. Again, not all the guidelines recommending, recommend screening asymptomatic individuals, but it's just a three word recall and a clock drawing test. It just takes a couple of minutes. And if they fail the test, then you know they need to come back for a more elaborate assessment. Next slide. The comprehensive geriatric assessment, I'm not gonna go into great depth here, but just to say that it involves a targeted history, looking for neurologic problems, hearing loss, that sort of thing. A cognitive and mental status exam using standardized tools and looking for psychiatric comorbidities and behaviors, a functional status evaluation, a good physical exam, um, especially neurologic exam, and then 
screening lab tests. And then if it's new onset of dementia and MRI, next slide. And the Alzheimer's Association has created toolkits for screening and for care planning that are very useful. They have all these tools in them. Next slide, please. They also um, have available for patients with early dementia or MCI uh, trial uh, matches. So people, if they want to engage in a clinical trial, can find out where they can go. And these are just the lists of some of the tools to measure just different aspects uh, like a um, for neuropsychiatric symptoms, either the BEHAVE-5 or the NPIQ would be recommended. Next slide. We use in our practice the SLUMS, which is the St. Louis University Memory Scale, very similar to the MOCA, which you may have heard of. That's a Montreal uh, scale. Uh, or the mini mental. The mini mental is copyrighted and the MOCA now requires a license. So that's why we've taken up the slums because it's not copyrighted and you can use it. Next slide. And this just shows that there is a downloadable version of this Alzheimer's toolkit, like a pocket card. Next slide. There is a billing code that you can use in the office, home, rest home, or assisted living, or via telehealth uh, that pays anywhere from like 266 to 278, depending on where you practice. It cannot be combined with other EM codes, and you have to have a moderate to high complexity or medical decision making level. And it requires an independent historian to verify the history but it is something that Medicare is doing now to recognize the time it takes to do these exams. Next slide. And this just goes over the requirements. Uh, you're, you need to evaluate safety, check the caregiver for stress, evaluate for neurocognitive symptoms and depression, reconcile meds, that sort of thing, and create a shareable care plan. They also recommend advanced care planning early on, as I mentioned above. Next slide. The treatments Dr. Palakar is going to go over, but the standards that have been around for several years include acetylcholinesterase inhibitors and memantine, which have moderate, modest benefit, and they do have side effects. And the Canadian guideline recommends stopping them when they no longer work and then avoiding sleeping pills and other, you know, like Benadryl or alcohol that could certainly, um, you know, exacerbate the, the dementia problems. Next slide. I'm just gonna go over a couple of cases very quickly to illustrate these points. Aura Olvadadiza is a 68 year old woman who is a full-time social worker. She has trouble recalling names. She misplaces keys, glasses, and her watch. She worries that she might have Alzheimer's because her mother does. So you have to ask yourself, how would you address this patient's concern? Next slide. Well, the recommendation would be to do formal neuropsych testing in her. This is the type of patient that warrants assessment, not the patient with the mini mental or 12 or a slums of 12. And they test um, executive function, visual, spatial language, and can a good neuropsychologist can guide you as to whether there is dementia present or just mild cognitive impairment and how frequently the patient should be tested. Next slide. The prevalence of uh, mild cognitive impairment is about 6.7% for 60 to 64, but it goes up as you can see, so that it's 25% for people in their early 80s. Uh, there's no pharmacologic treatment except possibly the newer monoclonal antibodies. Next slide. This is uh, the second case, a 69 year old man who works part-time at a Greek restaurant as a short order cook. 
He has metabolic syndrome. His hemoglobin A1C has been rising. He's non-compliant with medical appointments. He smokes in bed, and he's had multiple minor motor vehicle accidents. Next slide. His slums was 16. He was not depressed. He didn't have any behavioral issues to speak of. His MRI showed advanced white matter hyperdensities. His hemoglobin A1C was 10. He had a normal TSH B12 negative RPR. And on exam, he was hypertensive, obese, and he had no focal neurologic deficits. Next slide. So this would be a patient that you would probably put or consider acetylcholinesterase inhibitors and memantine um, and evaluate him frequently on these meds. Next slide. But even more importantly, this patient needs an on-the-road driving assessment. And the AGS has a toolkit, the older driver app. You know, there are some cognitive tests that you can give to predict poor driving, but the best thing is re to refer them to an occupational therapist or driver rehab specialist who could take them on the road and see how they actually drive. New slide, next slide. You also want to assess capacity. Um, and if the patient has medical decision capacity to really you know, get a most form filled out at this stage, because as the disease worsens, the patient may not be able to express his wishes. But capacity relates to things like personal care, where the patient lives, who invests, you know, in property or handles the finances, you need really probably durable power of attorney uh, and a healthcare proxy determined um, early on. Next slide. And then, you know, trying to establish the goals of care for this patient. Next slide. This is the most form I'm sure you're all familiar with. Next slide. Our last case is an elderly gentleman that I actually have followed. Um, he's similar to a patient that I've followed in my practice for over six years. And he had mild cognitive impairment when I first saw him. He was part of the idea study and had a PET, an amyloid PET CT that was positive in 2018. And over the ensuing years, he's become progressively more impaired functionally and cognitively. And um, wife put him in adult daycare at the town, but he was wandering and badgering other participants. So they asked him to leave. He has been urinating in the garbage pail instead of the toilet. Parent, he's very paranoid. Hallucinations keep him up at night. He has outbursts of anger where he screams at his wife. He's never hit her, but he screams at her. He's had falls and he's dependent in all ADLs and now several ADL functions. He's resistant to bathing, so he's hard for her to manage. She's also older. She's a retired nurse. Next slide. His mini mental was 12, PHQ 9.5, and behave AD 4. So I ask you, you know, how do you handle this patient? What stage is he in? Next slide. So he would be the fast stage 6C not quite late enough to qualify for hospice care. Next slide. But he has a lot of the common behavioral disruptive features, wandering, uh, social inappropriateness, sleep disturbances, misidentifications, et cetera, that you can see in advanced Alzheimer's. Next slide. And so there are various things that you can do uh, to help with these disturbances, like you can play white noise at nighttime to help them sleep or soothing music. There is something um, that nursing homes are using now called a snoozle in multi-sensory environment that helps with patients who have resistance to care. It almost looks like psychedelic, um, you know, a psychedelic uh, room. 
Uh, there are, there's a safe return program for patients who wander, pet therapy, that sort of thing. And you can always redirect and distract. If the hallucinations are not bothersome to the patient or to the family and they don't lead to aggressive behavior, they don't necessarily need to be treated. Next slide. This is the snoozling room. Next slide. Now, there was a Cochrane review in 2011 looking at antidepressants for agitation and, and psychosis in patients with dementia. And actually, citalopram and sertraline were associated with decreased symptoms of agitation, decreased anger. I've used it in citalopram, especially in several patients, and it has controlled the anger very nicely. I haven't had to use antipsychotics. Next slide. Now, the Choose Wisely campaign um, recommends that you only prescribe an antipsychotic if you've exhausted these other measures. And you need to discuss the risks and benefits before scribe, prescribing them. And you need to monitor for side effects, especially things like tardive dyskinesia. And you always want to if they're not working, taper them off. If they are working, reassess frequently. There are cardiac side effects. Um, Haldol has high EPS side effects with gait abnormality. They can get Parkinsonian. Um, so they're not, you never want to use a lot of these, you know, like a Haldol or Risperdone in someone with Parkinson's. You'd have to use a different kind of atypical antipsychotic. I don't want to get into the details, but just realize that there are things that can be done besides the antipsych antipsychotics. They're a last resort. Next slide. Next slide. And then lastly, this woman has caregiver burden and she needs respite um, and support. Next slide. And you need to think about what options are available. You know, there's medical and social model daycare programs. Their medical model's expensive. Um, she could privately hire help. Patient may need assisted living with ADL support or even nursing home care as the disease progresses. Certainly she could put an alarm on the door to alert her when he wanders, give him a safe return button, uh, and then look into veterans programs if he's a veteran. New, new slide, please. And there are several um, resource centers. We have, you know, County Office on Aging, New York State Office on Aging, and local chapters of the Alzheimer's Association. Um, you know, New York State has these SEED program centers of excellence. Some of them are research centers, some are centers for caregivers and patients. So there is support out there for counseling and education. New paragraph, new slide, please. And finally, you know, in a patient like this, you know, establishing the goals of care to really be, you know, comfort and palliation because he is nearing the final stages of Alzheimer's disease. And he has to be aware you have to have a serious illness talk about the prognosis because it's not good at stage 6C. Next slide. The hospice criteria are fast stage seven with at least limited speech or possibly an earlier stage if there is a severe comorbid condition that would make life expectancy six months or less. Next slide. So you can see it's at the only at the end stages where hospice kicks in. Last slide. And as I mentioned, feeding tubes, in there haven't been any randomized control controlled trials, but there have been comparisons um, of tube-fed patients with non-tube-fed, and the, they really don't impact significantly on mortality or pressure ulcer development uh, or you know, median survival, they are not recommended in the terminal phases of dementia. So that's why it's important early on to establish this with patients. Last slide. 
So in summary, uh, the take home messages are to incorporate cognitive and hearing loss screening into the annual Medicare wellness visit, uh, incorporate lifestyle counseling in younger high risk adults with hypertension, obesity, and metabolic syndrome or hyperlipidemia, try citalopram for anger management, early on establish healthcare proxy, wishes at the end of life, and durable power of attorney, and keep your eyes on the arteriosclerosis research because it may change management in the future. I'll end here and turn it over to Dr. Palagar. Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Fields, for that, for that wonderful uh, talk. Uh, with so much of important detail in it. I'm going to be shifting gears a little bit and talking about, you know, what are some of the advances in the biomarkers and treatment of AD at this point? Um, okay. Okay. Oops. Okay, so, so I have a few disclosures. I'm a consultant for a few of these pharmaceutical companies that are making some of these uh, medications. So this slide always gives me pause because every 65 seconds, there's someone in the United States that's developing Alzheimer's. So you can imagine the number of patients that we are gonna have with, with Alzheimer's in the next decade or two. Um, and in terms of age grouping, the rates do jump pretty dramatically in the age group of 75 to 84, one out of six, and goes up to one out of three when looking at the age group of 84 and older, um, or 85 and older. Um, so we have two pathologies that we know of. Uh, one are the amyloid plaques and tau tangles. Uh, that's it. Yep. So I'm sorry, there's a problem with my... There's a lag in my slides. So. But um, so we have the amyloid and tau accumulations and um, not know why these proteins start to accumulate and misfold and start to accumulate in the brain. What we do know is these protein accumulations start a couple of decades before the onset of symptoms. So this slide is really, really important because it really tells us the, the uh, how the pathology uh, starts to develop. Um, and uh, and uh, so when you see initially there's amyloid deposition, and then once a certain threshold is reached, it starts to trigger tau to start to misfold and form the neurofibrillary tangles. And it's actually the tau tangles that uh, are uh, intraneuronal and cause uh, neuronal uh, death or neural destruction. And then there's a pattern of gradual um, spread of tau tangles through various regions of the brain those, and that follows the symptomatic progression as well. Um, finally, there is a significant amount of neurodegeneration. So we see uh, cortical shrinking or atrophy, uh, medial temporal lobe, the hippocampus. Uh, we see low hippocampal volume, and we see impaired glucose metabolism as well. Um, and these uh, biomarkers track uh, with the progression of the symptom of the syndrome of dementia or Alzheimer's, actually. Uh, interestingly, uh, I think the, the reason, one of the reasons why we're having such a hard time finding a cure or, or a good treatment is because a lot of this is taking place before the patient actually shows up with symptoms or, you know, with mild memory problems. Um, and hence, by the time the patient actually comes to our clinic, when the boat has sailed, the brain has been dealing with these, these pathologies for, as I said, on a couple of decades uh, on average. Um, and the damage has been done. So to reverse that damage is extremely difficult at this point. Um, next slide, please. So uh, what do biomarkers do in general? We have three types of biomarkers at this time. We have CSF, imaging, and plasma, and they help us to aid in early diagnosis. And this is really important because the earlier we're able to diagnose this condition, the, um, the more uh, opportunities for patients to be able to take part in, in treatment, uh, treatments that can slow the progression of the illness. There are opportunities to take part in clinical trials that are mostly towards the early stage of the disease uh, population. And also, you have a lot of time to think about, you know, planning the future. Um, uh, the biomarkers also help us monitor the course of Alzheimer's. Um, and there are two types of biomarkers, direct biomarkers, which are the, the two 
that are common in the pathophysiology of AD, which is amyloid and tau, and they're indirect biomarkers, which uh, look at injury to the neuronal cells um, and regional patterns of abnormalities, which basically are um, look at MRIs and look at uh, fluorodeoxyglucose PET scans, which measure glucose metabolism. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about the current uh, biomarkers. So we have CSF biomarkers and one of the most common ones that is uh, ABDA42. Uh, and the typical signature that we see in, in Alzheimer's disease is a reduction of ABDA42 by 50%, which makes sense, right? I mean, more and more amyloid is getting deposited on the brain surface. So there's less of it in CSF. There's less clearance of amyloid. So the lower, so you'll see a lower level of amyloid accumulation uh, in the CSF of patients with Alzheimer's. Um, and then you have tau. Uh, tau is increasing, tau is misfolding, forming tangles. So there's an increase in the concentration of tau. Typically in patients with AD, you'll see about a 300% increase in the concentration of tau in the CSF. Next slide. Uh, but more than the total tau, what's really important is phosphorylated tau, because this is a tau that's really the one that uh, causes the tangles and the neuronal damage. So. Uh, we, we usually want to measure p tau, uh, and uh, we see that an increase of p tau by about 200% in CSF. Next slide. So, uh, what about in patients who are prodromal or in very early stages, like the MCI stage? In that situation, unfortunately, there has not been as much in terms of uh, the a good sensitivity or specificity for CSF, A beta tau, and p tau. Um, and so, we have to look for better biomarkers uh, that might be able to predict Alzheimer's. However, CSF, A, beta, 42 levels, um, even if you're looking at conversion, which is conversion, converting from MCI to AD, the CSF, A, beta, 42 levels were not really good at predicting uh, conversion as well. Uh, next slide. So where are we now in terms of biomarkers? So there's a biomarker of all neurofilament light, uh, and uh, this can be measured in the CSF as well as in plasma, but in the CSF, you really see a very good significant uh, correlation between the presence of neurofilament light and, um, and neurodegeneration, basically. Um, so the levels of NFL are increased in CSF. Um, and you can see also increase of uh, serum NFL levels. Uh, and this is a predictor of uh, new generation or, or progression of, of cognitive uh, disorders or, or Alzheimer's. Next slide. Um, inflammatory biomarkers are getting really, really um, popular because besides amyloid and tau accumulation, the other thing that's really happening in the brain is a lot of neuroinflammation. Now, we don't know it's, whether it's the accumulation of the proteins that's causing the inflammation or the inflammation causing uh, the accumulation of these, these proteins. So the chicken or the egg kind of situation. But what we do know is that we see a lot of neuroinflammation and we have uh, markers to measure that uh, in the CSF. Uh, uh, and these markers are highly expressed in the CSF in both patients with mild cognitive impairment as well as AD. And they are also being used potentially to monitor for progression of AD, which is something that would be very helpful um, besides doing our standardized yearly annual cognitive screenings and examinations. I think it's really good to have a biomarker that can help us monitor progression as well. Next slide. Uh, another uh, important CSF biomarker is called platelet-derived growth factor receptor B. Uh, it's highly expressed in the capillaries of the brain and uh, it's an early biomarker for the breakdown of the blood-brain barrier, which is seen sometimes pretty early in AD, even before the accumulation of amyloid and tau. Um, so this is something that's also been studied at this point. It's not yet uh, available commercially, but uh, there's some of the research studies have been using this as a potential biomarker. Next slide. So let's move to imaging biomarkers. Um, and currently we have uh, MRI, which, as Dr. Fields mentioned, is a standard protocol for uh, uh, assessment of patients uh, in the clinic with cognitive symptoms. And here on the left side, you see someone with a normal-looking brain. Uh, but on the right side, you see someone with Alzheimer's, and you can appreciate the cortical atrophy and the enlarged ventricles. Um, you also see Hippocamp bilateral hippocampal atrophies as well. And these days we can really uh, 
also measure <clears throat> the total brain volume. Uh, so we can do some volumetric analysis as well, um, which is really helpful. <clears throat> and it gives us a percentile of, of where the brain volume lies, um, which is important because uh, cortical atrophy is a quite a bad prognostic sign. Um, and the patients who have significant cortical atrophy, their illnesses progress much faster. They tend to progress much faster. Um, so this is something that we look for uh, in patients. Next slide. Uh, next slide. So this is uh, the fluorodeoxyglucose PET, our FDG PET. And this is a great uh, tool or test that can be used to differentiate specifically between Alzheimer's disease and frontotemporal dementia. It basically is looking at glucose metabolism. Um, patients are given a um, infusion, IV infusion of glucose before the scans are taken. And then we want to see how the neurons are utilizing glucose. Um, so this is a normal pattern that you see uh, where you see there's uniform uptake of, of glucose um, in the cortical areas. Um, next slide. Now, here you see a patient with mild cognitive impairment where you see that uh, there is already a change compared to normal where there is hypermetabolism of glucose and specifically in the palatotemporal regions. Uh, next slide. And here's a patient with Alzheimer's where you see that this um, decrease in absorption of glucose is even more pronounced. But interestingly, uh, the frontal lobes of the brain are show glucose metabolism or glucose activity. And uh, that's how you differentiate between FTD and AD. In patients with frontotemporal dementia, you would see a significant decrease in uh, glucose metabolism in the frontal lobes, as opposed to what we see in Alzheimer's, which is mostly impacting the temporal and the parietal lobes. Next slide. Um, so gold standard for diagnosis of, uh, oh, one thing I want to mention is that the FTG PET is actually covered by insurance. So as long as you state that this is to differentiate between FTD and AD, the insurance companies do cover the uh, FDG PET and we routinely get these FDG PET scans for our patients. In terms of the amyloid PET scan, unfortunately, CMS is not currently uh, providing coverage for the scans. Scans cost roughly about $6,000 each, so it's expensive, uh, but it's the gold standard. Um, and initially, it was uh, using uh, carbon-11, uh, also called as PIB or PIT, Pittsburgh Compound B. It was developed in the University of Pittsburgh. Um, but now we also use different radio tracers, such as 18-fluorine. So we have radioisotope of 18-fluorine called fluorbetapir or amuvid, which is the more popular one that we use uh, for amyloid PET scans. Um, there are several radio tracers, and they have quite a good specificity and sensitivity, and hence the gold standard. Next slide. So this is a, this is a image of uh, two patients, uh, one with AD and one with MCI, and you can appreciate the abundant accumulation of amyloid that's detected on the amyloid bed on the left side uh, in the yellow and orange uh, in patients with uh, AD, in this patient with AD. And you can also see the MRI below, which shows significant atrophy and enlarged ventricles. But as a person with MCI, you see some accumulation of amyloid out there, not clearly as much as uh, the patient with uh, AD. Uh, and the brain looks relatively um, normal um, with very little atrophy. Next slide. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is again, two patients, patient A and patient B. And uh, it basically shows that uh, in this case, there is uh, again, you know, significant amyloid accumulation in patient B compared to patient A. Uh, both these patients had MCI. The patient A remained in the MCI stage um, at the four year follow up um, in this particular uh, study, whereas patient B also had MCI, but significant amyloid accumulation and they converted to Alzheimer's. Um, within a year of the scan being taken. So, um, so yes, accumulation of amyloid plaques in the brain does increase, obviously, your risks of converting from MCI to AD. Um, next slide. Um, 
let's talk a little bit about Tau Pet, uh, and this is what we are really trying to um, get at now because amyloid is not the not, not the whole story, and uh, there are a lot of tauopathies um, that we see, um, um, which uh, are not specifically amyloid, uh, sorry, Alzheimer's disease, but you know other dementias that are also caused by the accumulation of tau. Um, and it is really helpful to have a tower PET scan where you can look at disease severity and progression, study potential disease modifying anti-tau treatments, and also inform patient enrollment for clinical trials. Next slide. So there are a lot of current tau tracers, uh, and uh, we're always trying to find a tracer that is, uh, uh, which binds to the specific target, in this case tau, does not have a lot of off-target binding because that creates a lot of noise uh, and uh, will not give you a good read, and does not have any radio metabolites that are re-entering the brain because that can again skew your your reading. So I'm just I just I just have a list of tau tracers and each of them has their risks and benefits or their strong points and you know their weak points, um, but uh, you know we are using tau tracers in a lot of our studies at Stony Brook and. Um, and they've been shown to be remarkably successful in, in measuring tau accurately. Next slide. Here's a list of uh, some more tau tracers. The last one is the most widely used tau tracer. That's a 18 fluorine radioisotope AV1451. Um, and uh, this is the one that we have been using quite a lot as well. As Next slide. These are some of the new pet trial tracers. Again, as I mentioned, the idea is that we want tracers to be as accurate as possible with good target engagement. Um, and But we need to study these trial tracers more longitudinally with the larger sample size to really establish uh, sensitivity and specificity. Um, so they can be then used, um, hopefully, um, in clinical practice someday, but definitely to uh, improve our accuracy of diagnosis uh, and also looking at potential um, therapeutic benefits of the new anti-tau agents that are in various stages of trials. Um, next slide. So this is an example of a tau tracer. Uh, this is MK6240. And this tracer now you can see that is in in, in four different types of patients. There's a healthy patient with the MMSE of 28, uh, and you see very little tau in the, in the patient's brain. Uh, you look at someone with mild Alzheimer's with a mental status, mini mental status of 23, you start to see more tau accumulation as the illness starts to get to progress. Uh, MMSE of 17, more significant tau accumulation. And finally, when you look at someone with a mini mental status of nine, which is kind of in the severe stage of the disease, you see there's pretty significant tau accumulation throughout the cortical and subcortical areas of the brain. Next slide. Uh, so neuroinflammation, again, as I said, neuroinflammation is becoming a very, very hot topic. And um, luckily we do have certain radio tracers that um, we can use to measure the amount of inflammation in the brain. So basically it's typically done by looking at this particular protein called a TSP or translocator protein, and which is basically upregulated on activated microglia. So inflammation, activation of microglia, upregulation of TSPO, and the radio traces that we use binds to TSPO. So it gives us a read of basically uh, if there's an increase in the levels of TSPO uh, in the brain. And so the most common, uh, Radioisotope uses a carbon 11 PBR28. There's also a bunch of uh, other radio tracers that we can use. There's one called FEPA, which is an 18 fluorine radio tracer. Uh, the other inflammatory target is this inotropic pyroceptor P2X7, again upregulated in activated microglia. Um, and uh, basically, there are some radio tracers that are now have been developed to target this particular uh, uh, receptor as well. Uh, as a surrogate marker for neuroinflammation. Next slide. Synaptic vesicle glycoprotein 2A, SV2A, really important. This radio tracer is able to bind to this, this molecule SV2A, which basically is predominantly present in the synapses. And it's a really good 
um, I guess, way to quantify or to measure synaptic density. And we know that one of the pathologies that takes place in, in Alzheimer's is synaptic loss. Um, so not only are the neurons being damaged or uh, having neuronal loss, but it's also lack of communication between neurons and between brain circuits. So the most commonly used radio tracer out here is UCBJ. Uh, there's an 11 radio tracer, but also a 18 Florian radio tracer that can be used. Uh, Yale is doing a lot of studies on SV2A at this point and has published some good data uh, uh, suggesting that this could be potentially an early biomarker in AD. Next slide. Let's talk about plasma biomarkers. This is hot, hot, hot topic right now, and I'll be brief fast about this because we don't have too much time, but um, we are going to very soon have a uh, commercially available finger stick biomarker to diagnose Alzheimer's. And uh, it's going to be measuring A beta 40 to 40 ratio uh, and, and plasma tau, uh, 181p tau or or 217 p tau, the different types of phosphorylated tau proteins that accumulate. There was a recent study that was, uh, the data was shared on the 19th of this month uh, at the uh, International Conference for the Alzheimer's Association International Conference. It's called the BioFinder Primary Care Study. In this study, there were about 500 patients. And what it did was they basically had these patients be evaluated by the primary care physicians for diagnosis of Alzheimer's. They were able to diagnose Alzheimer's accurately to about 55% of patients. However, when they used this finger test biomarker, um, where they had three of them, they had the amyloid beta ratio, the P tau 217 ratio, and they had a predefined algorithm known as the amyloid probability score. When they used that, they were able to diagnose accurately uh, about 80 to 85% of patients with Alzheimer's. So this is gonna be available in offices soon. And this is going to be a game changer, as you can see, because it's going to increase our ability to diagnose Alzheimer's uh, accurately um, and add to another tool to add to what we're already doing. Uh, next slide. So treatments. So we know Dr. Fields went over some of the treatments that are currently available, but I'm going to talk about some of the new treatments. Next slide. So we have immunotherapy. That's the hot area right now, anti-amyloid anti, anti, uh, monoclonal antibodies. There are three of them right now. So aduhelm or aricinumab was approved by the FDA uh, 2021, but did not show any clinical benefit. However, lacanumab or lacwembi, which finally received full FDA approval on the 6th of July, has shown a slowing of progression of symptoms by about 27% and has also shown a stabilization of functioning by about 30%. And donanumab, which finished its phase three trials and is not pending FDA approval anticipated at the end of the year, has shown an even better result where it has shown slowing of symptoms by about uh, 35% and uh, a stabilization of functioning by close to 40%. So again, it doesn't sound like a tremendous amount, but it's actually is a big deal because and, and it showed complete amyloid clearance from the brain, which is amazing. So they could clear the com amyloid completely and they showed functional improvement and clinical slowing of the disease, which is which gives patients many, many more years of being able to function at a higher level um, and um, you know, benefit from these treatments until we find you know, a cure hopefully or something that can stop the disease or prevent it altogether. So there's hope in the field right now. The main caution is that this does come with a risk and the risk of that is called aria or amyloid related imaging abnormalities and it's basically two types of aria there's aria e that's edema and aria h is hemorrhages and it is anywhere between 20 to 30 percent of patients who received these drugs developed aria um, most of the cases resolve spontaneously without any further negative sequelae or consequences but uh, it is it is something that needs to be monitored very closely with MRIs and and uh, potentially can be fatal. I think in the donanumab study, there were two patients that um, that died because of aria um, out of out of total of fifteen hundred. Um, but we need to monitor this very carefully and and make sure that we are we are um, we are taking the decision of giving these medications. Um, knowing the benefits and the risks. Uh, next slide, please. 
So there are a lot of advances in treatments, and I'll go very fast over it. There are many, many different molecules and drugs and, and stuff that are that's ongoing right now. Um, so uh, next slide. This is just a, uh, so there are, again, as I said, 132 agents uh, in 156 clinical trials. So a lot going on, targeting various different molecules um, imaginable. Next slide. So here is a, a big kind of just a pie chart. I know this is, is a lot of detail, but it just goes to show the enormity of the amount of clinical trials in different phases. The outer ring is phase one, middle ring is phase two, and the center ring is phase three. So we have a lot of different targets. We have targets that are looking at, um, you know, um, the tau protein, they're looking at inflammation, they're looking at, of course, amyloid. Um, and uh, there are other molecules that are also looking at agitation and psychosis and, and depression and other, some of these behavioral and psychiatric symptoms that are associated with Alzheimer's. Next slide. There are also, uh, there are also a lot of devices that are being tested, right from TDCF to direct current stimulation, uh, Sonocloud, which is an ultrasound that seems to help in, in reducing or decreasing the uh, amyloid load by increasing amyloid clearance from the brain. Uh, Neurogamma, which is low energy infra, near infrared LED light therapy. Um, ECT, I know it normally causes cognitive uh, memory impairments, but it has shown to have some improvements or increases in, in the brain derived BN. Uh, BN brain-derived neurotropic factors uh, levels, which is, is good for neurogenesis. Um, next slide. Okay, and, and list goes on and on. There's, of course, deep brain stimulation. There's also RTMS, which is transmagnetic stimulation. Uh, there's vagal nerve stimulation. So there's lots of different stimulation devices that are being tested at this point. Um, next slide. So at CIAD, uh, we have a bunch of clinical trials that are ongoing right now. Some of them are sponsored by NIA, uh, NIH. Some of them are industry-sponsored trials. Uh, we also have a COVID study looking at the impacts of long COVID and cognitive impairment. Um, and so um, we are really kind of trying to uh, provide uh, patients uh, and the community of Long Island with opportunities to engage in clinical trials and, and research studies. Uh, last slide, I believe. So in summary, we need to improve and implement early diagnostic testing and biomarkers uh, fundamentally as this will be really important in, in early diagnosis as well as prognosis and monitoring of uh, our new treatments that are coming out, the anti-amyloid and anti-tau treatments, uh, developing new radio tracers for targeting specific molecules in the brain, um, continuing translational research. We have had a lot of success in finding good treatments in the mice model, right? But does it translate to the human brain? And that's kind of where the issue is. Increasing advocacy and awareness is extremely important um, because that helps to really get this uh, issue into the forefront. And uh, it's really important to talk about care management and planning as Dr. Fields did to address disabilities that are associated with dementia. Last slide. Yep, so thank you so much. Uh, so uh, our contact number is, is right here, 631-954-2323. This is for referral for patients. This is for research, clinical trials. You want any information about it? You want resources uh, for your patients or for you know families, caregivers? We just have one number for all of this. Uh, so please you know, give us a call and we are here to help you in any way we can. With that, I wanna thank you for um, for your time and for uh, inviting me to talk today. Thank you so much, Dr. Fields and Dr. Palakar, both for your wonderful talks. I think we're all going to see so many patients, unfortunately, with the disease, uh, regardless of what area of medicine you practice. Um, I put in the chat if anybody had any questions. Um, we want to be mindful of everyone's time. I don't want to keep um, anyone too late this evening. But if you had any burning questions for either Dr. Fields or Dr. Palakar, feel free to enter them and we can ask in the, the next few minutes. If not, thank you so much for those of you that have joined. We really appreciate your attendance. Dr. Palakar, if we have patients that we wanna refer for these studies, we just 
um, yeah. can give out that phone number. Is that correct? That's the phone number. Yeah, and okay. uh, yeah, and the person that is is handling our our referrals uh, is one of our social workers, Daniel Emerson. Mm -hmm. And so you can just leave a message uh, on that line and then Dan, Dan will basically respond back and speak, call the patient. And, you know, usually what we get is we get phone num we get patients or caregivers calling and leaving their name and contact number and we call them yeah. back and then we assess them as to, you know, what stage they are in and what studies are more appropriate mm -hmm. for them. And so we do all of that stuff. So you don't have to take, do any of that. Just give them the number, let them call and we'll take care of, you know. Great. Um, because yeah, sometimes they might not meet criteria for one study, but they might meet yeah. criteria for some some other study that's ongoing and might right. be helpful for them. Wonderful. Perfect. And it looks like there's a question asking for some more information about the Alzheimer's disease vaccine. If either of you could speak to that. Oh, um, I can give it a shot. I mean, there is there's a vaccine that is in development, but I am not sure how further along it is at this point as in what the data looks like on it um because it's a really difficult um how do i put this as i showed in my slides where the the proteinopathies and the pathology starts to occur like a couple of decades before the onset of symptoms the question is when do you give someone this vaccine like and who do you give this vaccine to should it be given to everybody should it be given to you know only the high risk people with the apoe gene mutation or first degree relatives of patients so there are a lot of questions and so i don't really have a lot of information besides yeah that there is something that is being looked at Maybe dr fields has uh, probably some more to add yeah, yeah. It looks like one more question asking about um, what are the impacts of social networking in Alzheimer's disease and mild cognitive impairment? And I wonder if um, Dr. Raza wants to unmute just to make sure we're understanding kind of the, the question correctly. Uh, yes, hi. So uh, just, um, uh, this is Dr. Raza um, and I work with Dr. Fields. Uh, just a question about I've seen uh, and read a few um, articles about the impact of uh, of uh, social networking uh, um, and their effects on the um, Alzheimer's disease. There's a study about mostly in the elder women, and it showed um, that it delayed um, the symptoms and uh, delayed the the uh, progressivity of um, the Alzheimer's disease. So, is Dr. Field or Dr. Polikin know about any study? Or is it advisable uh, for our patients who are showing mild cognitive impairment to involve in social networking? Or, you know, there's a lot of spam, scams going on as well. So what as an um, internist or primary care of our advice if the patient asks, especially um, the patient who are, or the families, if are they at the cusp of uh, mild cognitive impairment or um, AD? I think the Lancet paper goes over that. This is Suzanne very nicely. Um, that they describe a lot of different efforts at trying to um, engage patients um, with some cognitive behavioral therapy, but also with increased interactions with others and socialization. Uh, because certainly social isolation has been found to be a risk factor for dementia. So it would make sense, although I'm not sure how successful. I, I'm not aware of a lot of papers showing great deal of benefit from the socialization, but it would make sense, I think, um, to at least offer it to patients. What does help is keeping them engaged, you know, cognitively engaged, that that is very important and socially engaged, not letting them, you know, kind of be off by themselves. My question is about the social networking on the web, like Facebook or or not like a personal social networking. Like, uh, if, I mean, everybody has a cell phone. So is it involving on a Facebook or different kind of community on the web or the internet? Is Are, are there any have a benefit, especially when we have just recently have a COVID and, you know, uh, it's very difficult. People live far. So is there any impact of a web social networking? on Alzheimer's or mild cognitive impairment delaying? Um, that's what my specific question. 
So I can talk a little bit about that. I agree with what Dr. Fields just said. And I think social engagement, we encourage it strongly because the other reasons for it also, because isolation can cause depression and depression, again, is a risk factor as well. So you don't want patients to get depressed. Um, you have a very interesting point that you're making about Dr. Raza about using like Facebook or Snapchat or Instagram or all these social media sites that, that help people to connect with each other. I'm really not aware of the literature, but I might say that if you're really sitting by yourself and isolated and not really engaged, I think that's better than, <laughs> I think it's, it's definitely better to be on Facebook and have some kind of social connection, but I don't know to what extent that would benefit uh, or replace the real personal one-to-one -one kind of interaction or group interactions that are very beneficial as, as humans, basically. And they really promote neuronal functions and um, they really help with, uh, you know, mood regulation and just overall just make us more happy and, and, and satisfied in life, right? Having friends and having social kind of, you know, um, a, a social group to hang out with. But, but I look into your question, I'll get back to you. I'll definitely do some research on my end because that's interesting as well, yeah. Uh, I haven't had patients ask me about that. They usually ask me about, should I play Sudoku or should I play, you know, do a crossword? And I say, yeah, do anything that you like because it's all good. So, but this is really interesting about Facebook and, and you know. There is, if, there is parenthetically a, um, a grant out that Cabrini Foundation has sponsored to create like a virtual senior center um for <laughs> patients online so it's sort of like a social i guess you could say that social media um but it is literally a virtual you know they have lectures, talks i don't know if they do bingo but you know it's a lot of <laughs> it's a lot of fun for the patients and they they're offering it to veterans as well uh, i can get you more information on that if you're interested that is a great idea though. Yeah, yeah. because yeah. The other, there was one question that came up about uh, COVID and, you know, have you seen? Yes, we did see actually. So a lot of my patients that we, I was treating uh, did much worse during COVID. Their symptoms progressed much faster and uh, it was really unfortunate. Uh, so that isolation had a very negative impact on cognitive functioning um, of patients, especially with dementia. They had a much higher death rate too during the COVID surge. Yes. Much higher death rate. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. This has been fun. We'll get back to you on some of those other questions, but you may want to look at the Lancet article because they go into, um, in Europe, they're doing a lot of studies on, um, you know, cognitive therapy and socialization um, therapy. And so I would refer you to that article. Thank you both so much. Thank you.